Ketuvim, Old Testament in Hebrew, the three sections, the Torah, the Law of Moses, the Pentateuch, the Navim of the Prophets and the Ketuvim, or things like uh, Psalms and so forth. And it's very nice. This is the Decalogue. This represents Hamelech uh, Olam, God is Yahweh is king, and these are the symbols of the 12 tribes. This says, Ki Metzion Te'e Torah Ve'edvar Yehovah or Dvar Adonai Me'erushalayim The law of the Torah shall go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. That's what it says, and on the back it says, Misgeret Yerushalayim, remembering Jerusalem. And it's very, very ornate, and it's very nice, and I will give it a place of pride. When I get back to England, my wife will like it very much. Thank you so much. Very nice, yes. Please make sure that we switch these off so the recording will be of reasonable quality. Well, let's go to the book of Acts chapter 6 today, please, in the New Testament, Acts chapter 6. Heavenly Father, we come before you once again, thankfully, rejoicing in your goodness and salvation. We know, Lord, that you hear our prayers because of your Son, Yeshua, Jesus, but we know, Lord, when we read your word by your Spirit, you speak back to us. Speak back to us today, Lord God, as we seek to know you better. Let these things increase our knowledge, but increase our knowledge with the aim of being more conformed to the image and likeness of your Son and more effective in serving him. In his name, the one who saved us, the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. The book of Acts, chapter 6, verse 1. Now at that time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. Notice when it's increasing. Many churches today are facing the problems of decline. Many churches are facing the problems of decline. But when you have a problem of decline, you can identify the problem and you know <laughs> what you need to do. You need to seek the Lord about a solution to the decline. What Christians tend to overlook is growth can cause just as many problems, just as many challenges. When a church, when a ministry is growing, there's going to be problems, there's going to be challenges, the same as decline. Now, what a wonderful problem to have. We'd rather have the problems of growth than the problems of decline, but they're going to be problems nonetheless. The second thing we see is this. It's much like modern Israel today. Israelis are quite different sociologically and culturally than diasporic Jews. Quite different. They really are. Um, very different in many respects. Uh, I won't go into that now, but you see there's a schism here between the diasporic Jews and what we would today call Sabras, the native Jews living in Israel. There was a schism. And this schism got into the church. And this is even within the Jewish community, people with the same faith and same ethnicity. Ah. When you have a multi-ethnic, multi-racial church environment, bear in mind that Satan is always trying to take the social divisions of the world and bring them into the church. Here in California, it could be the gringos and the mexicanos. Or those butchers. <laughs> okay. It could be black and white, obviously. It could be Asian and Westerner. It could be anything. It doesn't really matter what it is. But the ethnic tensions of the world can get into the church, even between Jew and Gentile, but even between Jew and Jew. Uh, I, I've seen this so many times. Uh, Egyptian Arabs don't get along with Jordanian Arabs. <laughs> I've seen this so many, you know, and the Chinese of Taiwan and, and Hong Kong and Singapore don't like the ones of Beijing and Shanghai. It's even within, you know, if there's not another ethnic community to fight with, they'll fight among themselves. <laughs> it 
can happen with Native Americans and, and Euro Americans and so forth. Don't let that stuff from the world, secular society, get into the church. We only have two kinds of people, the ones who are born again and the ones who need to be. That's not to say there's not different cultures and languages and things like that. You know, I, well, when I speak English and Spanish, but it's okay, that's okay. But we're one in Jesus. Now, this problem of growth. Remember, growth causes problems. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. There's nothing wrong with serving tables. The very fact that the apostles trained by Jesus were the waiters and food distributors shows you they had an attitude not of superiority, but an attitude of servantship. Be careful of people who will not make tents. Be careful of people who go into the ministry for a career. If they go into the ministry for a career instead of a calling, or even a vocation instead of a calling, it's going to wind up being a racket. That you went for it, what the scriptures Peter calls sordid gain. I filled prescriptions in Israel six days a week in co a congregation. I did evangelism on the side. I mean, I did it for years. Only about a year and a half ago, Marco gave up his secular job. If the ministry gets large enough where the demands of the ministry require somebody full-time, praise God, do it. But the idea of somebody not being willing to make tents is not a good thing. It's not a good thing. It's very easy for somebody who gets paid for being a Christian <laughs> to stand at a pulpit and tell you how to be spiritual and you're not being spiritual enough. He's not stuck in a traffic jam on the I-10 trying to get into work in L.A. You know, he's not in the real world dealing with unsaved people. He doesn't know what you're going through. A pastor has to relate to the sheep. Ah, be careful of people who've not paid their dues in the secular world, who don't understand what secular world is like, who just got out of Bible college or seminary, and you went to the ministry with any background, dealing and living in the secular world. Unless you've been in it, you're not going to be able to shepherd people who are. But let's look a bit further. Therefore, brethren, select from yourselves seven men of good reputation. It's interesting it's seven. Fill of this full of the spirit and wisdom whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procordus, and Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte, that is a Gentile convert to Judaism, from Antioch. And they bought, before, bought, them before the apostles, and after praying, they laid hands on them. Now let's understand this. Seven is the number of the church, usually, in biblical typology. Seven. Seven deacons. When we look at Timothy, and we look at Titus, we see that the qualifications of a elder and deacon are almost identical. Almost identical. The Old Testament equivalent was the tribe of Levi. You had the ordinary Levites who looked after the physical things, such as the instruments of sacrifice and the transportation of the tabernacle and so forth, and the main, physical maintenance of the temple. And you had the Kohanim, the priests who actually did the sacrifice. But they all had to be of the same qualification. The tribe of Levi, the same as Aaron, even though. There were priests and Levites. So in the body of Christ, we have deacons and we have elders. But the qualifications are the same. He who is faithful in little is faithful in much. Do not ever demean the importance of people who look after the physical, financial, administrative maintenance of a church. There is a gift of administrations that is found in the book of Corinthians. These are the people who keep the wheels running 
But notice, they must be people of a spiritual stature to do the physical things. Be careful of this. Human ability, even human ability sanctified to God is not a qualification of itself. Somebody could be a classically trained musician from a conservatory or, or Juilliard or something like this. That does not make them a worship leader. Somebody could be a good physician. That does not make them a medical missionary. Somebody could be a good trial lawyer. That does not make them a persuasive preacher. The human ability may be there, may be consecrated to God, and God will use it after it's been to the cross and broken. It is only the Holy Spirit who can commission somebody for ministry. Human ability is to be taken into account, but it is not the calling of God in and of itself. This is a separate but related subject. Remember the parable of the talents in the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 25. He gives the talents and it says, he gave the talents of each according to their ability. There is a correlation between natural gifts and spiritual gifts, but they are not equal. They are not identical. So these people had to be called. The next thing we see is in the ministry of Stephen particularly, that deaconship was a prep school for eldership. Deacon means servant. Shamash in Hebrew, servant in, in Greek. Not dolos, not slave, but servant. Yeah, not bond servant, but, but, but raw bond servants, but servants. A servant spirit. The apostles are waiting on tables. If somebody aspires to be in full-time ministry, if somebody aspires to be a pastor or a leader or a whatever, are they the kind of people who are more than willing to stay after church and put the chairs away and hover the carpet, make the coffee, do the practical things of the church? Do they have a servant spirit? It is the people with the servant spirit who the Lord commissions for leadership. The world does not look for servants to make them leaders. God looks for servants to make them leaders. He recruits his leaders from his servants. If there's not a servant spirit, you don't qualify for leadership. You'll wind up like the world, lording it over them. Okay. Well, let's continue. The apostles laid hands on them. Notice it was an ordination. Only God can ordain a minister, but there was a recognition of it through this commissioning by the church. The word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. The modern Jewish historian Max Demont, he's a semi-academic, but his books are very popular, he wrote the, the very widely read book called God, the Jews, and History. He, among others, states that by the second century, by the time of Bar Kokhba's rebellion, perhaps 25%, at least 25%, of the Jews in Jerusalem believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And that's an incredible thing. One out of four Jews in Jerusalem believed he was the Messiah at the time of Bar Kokhba's rebellion. And that's what the real problem began because the Jewish believers wouldn't follow Bar Kokhba as the Messiah at the behest of Rabbi Akiva. They knew Yeshua, Jesus, to be the Messiah. And that was one of the things that caused the schism between believing Jews and the Jewish community at large. But in the beginning, it was not like that. There were problems with the Sanhedrin from the beginning in the book of Acts. Then there was something called Abakata Minim at about 90 AD where there was a curse on Jewish believers. But the real split came with Bar Kokhba. But by the time the split came, one out of four Jews in Jerusalem believed. And that's something to take into account when we read things like the Epistles to the Hebrews. Nonetheless, let's read this. And of course, that was after 70 AD, which is also a factor. And so we see this. Many, but many of the Kohanim, the priests, according to Moses, there's no such thing as a rabbi. According to Moses, according to the Torah, there was no such thing as a synagogue. The 
clergy were the Levites and the priests. Rabbis and synagogues developed during the Babylonian captivity and then developed further in the intertestamental period. Jesus was a rabbi. Paul was a rabbi. In Acts 5, Gamaliel was a rabbi. But they're not taught in the Torah. Now what happened after the temple was destroyed is a classmate of St. Paul called Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai said, the synagogue replaces the temple, the mitzvot works replace the sacrifices, and the rabbi replaces the kohenim. Says Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai, says the rabbis. The Torah doesn't teach that. The Torah teaches no such thing. It says the priest, the kohenim. Many of the priests believe. I have been convinced for more than 25 years that before Jesus comes, we are going to see an increase in the number of Orthodox Jews and rabbis coming to believe he's the Messiah. I believe a time will come when synagogues will split over the issue of his Messiahship. I am firmly convinced we are going to see souls of Tarsus. I've only known a few rabbis who got saved. I've known a number of Orthodox Jews who've gotten saved in the United States, in Israel, England, but only a few rabbis thus far, thus far. More is coming. What God did in the early church, he's going to do again. I'm convinced. I'm absolutely convinced. The number of Jewish believers, although it's still very small, in proportion to what it was before the 1960s, <laughs> you can't calculate it. It's, the growth has been exponential. I recall when there was about 200 Jewish believers in Israel, about 200, in the days of Moshe ben Ma'ir. I don't know how many thousands there are now. I don't think anybody knows, but it's thousands. Let's continue. Notice many of the priests believed. Now, this created an issue. These were people of formal theological education having to come and sit at the feet of fishermen from Galilee. <laughs> that is one of the reasons God began raising up people like Paul, Barnabas, and Apollos, people of education and stature and rabbinic background. Paul, a classmate of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai, both of them had been students in the rabbinic academy of the school of Hillel, run by Rabbi uh, Gamaliel in Acts chapter 5. That same Rabbi Gamaliel mentioned in 5 was Paul's tutor. So let's continue. Stephen, filled with grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. In the seam of Niflaots, signs and wonders. But some men from what was called the synagogue of the freed men, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen. Things haven't changed much. I was just dealing with a situation the other day in Arad, in Israel, a congregation I know, were being horribly harassed and persecuted by the Gur Hasidim. Most of those guys come from Brooklyn. They bust them down from B'nai Brak, the, head to, the religious community at Tel Aviv, to harass the, the, the congregation, the Messianic Fellowship in, in Arad. Kach, the JDL in America, and these things, they're mostly American. Operation Judaism has a branch or affiliate in Israel called Yad Lachim, but it's mostly American or diasporic, particularly American. Secular Israelis tend to be much more tolerant of believing Jews. Secular Israelis become fed up and disgusted with the religious parties. Why should I have to go to the army and you don't? You get to sit in the yeshiva and get paid for it. It's subsidized when I have to go to the army. 
I can't even begin my education until after I've been in the Army three years, and then if the Army needs me, they can call me up for Milloween reserve duty, and you sit in the yeshiva and expect to be supported for it. Secular Israelis resent this. They see Jewish believers, and there's a lot of them now, serving in the military. Most of the Jewish believers, in the, my son was in the IDF, in the, in the combat brigade, before they transferred him to the legal corps because he's a lawyer, but he was in tanks. Almost all Jewish believers in Israel volunteer for combat. You have Kravi and Lo Kravi. Kravi is the, are the fighters, the shooters. Almost all believers are shooters. <laughs> they volunteer for it. The yeshiva boys, they're, <laughs> they're nowhere to be found. Most There is religious soldiers called Hezda Yeshiva, but they're not the ultra-Orthodox who really hate believers. Same as now, it was mainly diasporic religious Jews who persecuted Stephen, according to the things have not changed much. It's rather amazing when you look at it. So it happens. Now we begin to see a parody between the experience, oh, not a, par a parallel, between the experience of Jesus in the Passion Narratives and what transpires in the martyrdom of Stephen. They were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Remember Matthew 10, Jesus, what he said? Don't take account beforehand what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will give you wisdom. Then they secretly induced men to say, we heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. What did they do with Jesus? They brought false witnesses. He spoke against the Torah and against the temple. What they did to Yeshua, to Jesus, they did to Stephen. A servant is not above his master. Be careful of the word faith lying, hypocrite, mammon-worshipping money preachers. You don't have to suffer. You're a king's kid. Blab it and grab it. Come with me to Vietnam. I'll show you Christians who suffer terribly and who are suffering terribly. And their faith in Jesus is incredible. It's the only thing they have. A servant is not above his master. Maybe the word faith money preachers are but not the true servants of, of Jesus. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, just like the Sanhedrin stirred up the people against Yeshua. You see, Luke in his writing is drawing a parallel between what happened to Yeshua and what's happening to Stephen. Now other places in the book of Acts, it does that with Paul and a bit with Peter. But it's structured like that to teach us. Let's continue. And they came up to him and dragged him away and brought him before the council. The Sanhedrin. Same as Jesus. And they put forward the false witnesses. Same as Jesus. This man incessantly speaks against this holy place, the temple, and the Torah. Same as Jesus. For we have heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus, Yeshua HaNotri, will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed us down. What did they accuse Yeshua of at the trial? He said he's going to destroy the temple and raise it up in three days. Painting. And fixing their gaze on him, all were sitting in the Sanhedrin, the council, they saw his face like the face of an angel. Now it contrasts him to Moses, to Moshe Rabbeinu. You understand? He is going to reveal the real meaning of the Torah. In his apology before his martyrdom, we have Stephen's apology. And he's going to tell the people what Moses really meant.
is in the character of Moses. The Shekinah is reflecting from his face. Now, when you have people like that, <laughs> you get so close to the light, you reflect it. In their mind, they're so close to the light, they see the dirt. <laughs> they don't think they're so sanctimonious or righteous. <laughs> Other people see it. But they don't think it about themselves. They're unaware of it. Others will see the power of Christ in them. They will see the Shekinah emanating, reflecting from them. But the people themselves who are like that, they don't see it that way. And the high priest, just like Yeshua, said, are these things so? It's like they asked Jesus. And he said, hear me, brethren and fathers. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Now here we see something interesting. The book of Genesis, Breshit, tells us that God begins dealing with Abraham with the death of his father Terah in Haran. The book of Acts tells us God was calling him from Mesopotamia. There were Jewish traditions, historical traditions that had historicity, found in things like the Mishnah, that Jews know, knew about that were not in the scriptures. This was one of them. It's the New Testament that tells us God called him from Mesopotamia, uh, not, not the Torah. But there were things that were known, and we have records of some of them, particularly in things like um, the Mishnah. Well, let's look. God called Abraham. Leave your country, your relatives, and come to the land I show you. Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. And God had him move to this country where you are living. In his apology, not apology in the sense of being contrite, but apology in the sense, of course, of giving a credible defense of what he believes. In his apologia, he begins with the patriarchal narratives. With Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov, and the sons of Jacob, culminating with Joseph. Let's look. He goes on and on and on, and he tells about what happened and about the deliverance from Egypt. But then it gets to verse 14. Then Joseph sent word and invited Jacob, his father, and all the relatives to come to him, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down to Egypt, and there he and our fathers died. From there they were removed to Shechem, today it's Nablus, and laid in the tomb which Abraham had purchased for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. Now this is something complicated because the tomb of the patriarchs is in Hebron. I won't deviate today. But at the same time, of the promise was, was approaching, which God had assured to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt. When you see these rabbis who tried to argue against Jewish believers, they're always looking for contradictions or apparent contradictions in the New Testament and say, see, contradicts, it's contradictory, like Tubia Singer, it's contradictory. They're, they're really big on this, looking and they comb the New Testament for contradictions. Of course, they don't want to deal with the fact that you've got those same issues in the Hebrew Scriptures. Was he buried in Shem or was he buried in Hebron? Or the differences between the genealogies of Ezra and, and Chronicles and in Genesis? They don't like... <laughs> they're quite happy to attack the New Testament on that ground, but they're not happy to acknowledge the fact that those same critical issues exist in the Hebrew Scriptures. And there, is, there are plausible explanations for these things. But let's continue. What he's saying is, Joseph, he climaxes his first section of his defense with Joseph, of his apology with Joseph. So the first section of his apology is the patriarchal climaxing with Joseph. Most of you know this. 
In Judaism, we have two pictures of the Messiah. Hamashiach ben Yosef, Hamashiach ben David. Does anybody not know what I'm talking about? Does anybody want me to explain it? You all understand. You don't understand. Messiah, the son of Joseph. Messiah, son of David. The rabbis understand that Joseph, the son of Jacob, prefigures the Messiah in some way, but he's a suffering servant. He's identified with Ben Ephraim, the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 in the rabbinic literature. But the other is the son of David. The son of David is the conqueror who sets up the kingdom of God. Sonship in Hebrew thought is not biological pedigree only or necessarily. Son of means in the character of. Sons of light, like the Essenes, or sons of righteousness, in the character of. So the Messiah would be in the character of David, although he would be a biological son of David, literally, descendant from the tribe of Judah, but he would also be the son of Joseph, in the character of. It's fortuitous or providential that Jesus' foster father's name was Joseph. Joseph means Yahweh shall add. Now let me explain this. Remember, Jesus tells Peter in the Matthew's Gospel, I think it's chapter 16, Shimon Bariona, Simon, son of Jonah. It may be that Peter's father's name was Jonah. Bar is the Hebrew of Ben, of Aramaic for Ben, son of. You're in the character of Jonah. In Jaffa, the ancient port on the south side of modern Tel Aviv, Jonah does not want to go to the Gentiles, and God has to deal with them. So in the house of Simon the Tanner, Peter is in Jaffa and doesn't want to go to the Gentiles, to Cornelius and his family. God had to deal with them. Peter was in the character of Jonah. You understand? Sonship has to do, in biblical Hebrew thought, with being in the character of. Okay. So, Joseph in Genesis. Joseph was condemned after being betrayed by his brothers. God took that betrayal to the Gentiles and turned it around and made it a way for all Israel, all the world to be saved. So Jesus, the son of Joseph, was betrayed to the Gentiles. God took that betrayal and turned it around and made it a way for all Israel, all the world to be saved. Joseph was condemned with two criminals. And as Joseph prophesied, one would live, one would die. Jesus, the son of Joseph, was condemned with two criminals. And as he prophesied, one would live, one would die. They brought Joseph's shroud to prove he was not in the tomb. They brought Jesus, uh, I'm sorry, they brought Joseph's cloak to prove he was not in the pit. Okay. Joseph went from a place of condemnation to a place of exaltation in a single day, and every knee had a bow. Jesus, the son of Joseph, goes from a place of condemnation to exaltation in a single day, every knee shall bow. Upon exaltation, Joseph takes a Gentile bride. In figure, upon exaltation, Jesus, son of Joseph, takes a predominantly Gentile bride, the church. Okay. Joseph is betrayed by his brother Yehuda, Judas, for 20 pieces of silver. As I put it, adjusted for inflation, Jesus is betrayed by Yehuda, Judas, for 30 pieces of silver. It goes on and on like this. Only Joseph's brothers did not recognize him at the first coming. Now, there's more to this than I'm telling you. His brothers did not recognize him at the first coming. They recognized him at the second and wept bitterly. This one we rejected and betrayed to the Gentiles is our Savior. So, Yeshua, the son of Joseph, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, they will look upon me who they have pierced. And mourn as one mourns an only son, and beep, weep bitterly over him, like the bitter weeping of her firstborn. Now what's important, and I say this for the camera, the same rabbi who said Isaiah 53, 
and 52 and 53 is about Israel, not about the Messiah. Is this called Rashi? But the same Rabbi Rashi who said that admitted Zechariah 12 is about the Messiah being crucified. <laughs> I'd love to debate Tuv Yasinga, but let's continue. So you have the Messiah, the son of Joseph, okay? But then you have the Messiah, the son of David, the conquering king who sets up the kingdom. The throne of David, the house of David, was lost at the Babylonian captivity. The Jews believed the Messiah had to restore it. When Jesus is ascending in Acts chapter 1, the last thing the apostles ask him, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom? In other words, we know you're the son of Joseph now. We get that. You're the suffering servant. <coughs> but when are you going to be the conquering king and set up the kingdom, restore it to Israel? If Yeshua is not the Moshiach, Jesus is not the Christ, the early Christians all believed he would actually fulfill those prophecies. The early church was 110% premillennial. All this amillennial, postmillennial hogwash belongs in the garbage because that's where it came from. They invented it after the time of Constantine the Great when he pseudo-Christianized the Roman Empire for political purposes. The early Christians understood Jesus had to fulfill all the Old Testament prophecies, both the son of Joseph and the son of David. In his first coming, he fulfills the son of Joseph ones. In his second coming, he will fulfill the son of David once, and he will literally reign from Jerusalem. You understand? So, Stephen says in his apology, first section of his apology, the reason you are rejecting me is because you're rejecting Yeshua. You denounce him as Yeshua Hanotri, Jesus from Nazareth. That was like a sleazy town, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I'm from the Bronx, you know. Something. I'm from East LA. Yeah, that would have guessed. I'm from Boyle Heights. Yeah, prove it. Where's your switchblade? <laughs> so they're denouncing. Okay. What Stephen is saying is. You're rejecting Jesus, the son of Joseph, because you rejected Joseph. Then he shifts gears, and he goes into the second phase of his apology. The mosaic. He begins with the patriarchal. Then he goes into the mosaic. He tells the story of Moses. Verse 30, 40 years passed. An angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, and so forth and so forth. Moses was in the wilderness of Midian 40 years. Verse 35, Moses, whom they disowned, saying, Who made you a judge over us? Is the one whom God sent to be both a ruler and a deliverer with the help of the angel who appeared to him? In the thorn bush. <laughs> what happens with Moses? The first time he comes to save Israel, <coughs> they reject him. In their desperation, the second time he comes to save Israel, they accept him. So it will be with unbelieving Israel and the Jews. The first time they reject him. But after the time of Jacob's trouble, at the end of the age, so the church is raptured out of here in their desperation. They will accept him. So, what Stephen is saying is, you reject Jesus because you rejected Moses. Deuteronomy 18, the Messiah had to be a prophet like Moses, give a covenant. 
Moses was rescued by the faith of his parents from a wicked king trying to kill the Jewish babies. Jesus was rescued by his parents from a wicked king trying to kill the Jewish babies. <laughs> of course you're going to reject Jesus. Remember, as we always say, John chapter 5. If you believed Moses, you'd believe me also. The problem with unsaved Jews, once again, as we said yesterday, if you weren't here, is not that they don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. Their rejection of Jesus as the Messiah is not the problem. It is the result of the problem. It is the consequence of the problem. It is the terrible ramification of the problem that they don't believe their Messiah. But it's not the problem. The problem is they don't believe the Torah. They don't believe Moses and the prophets. If they really believed the Old Testament, they would believe the New. If they really believed Moses and the prophets, the Hebrew prophets, they would know he's the Messiah. If you believe Moses, you'll believe me also. Always remember, the Jewish rejection of Jesus is the consequence of the problem. It's not the problem. They don't believe the Torah. Paul says that the Torah is our tutor to lead us to Christ. If you don't learn to listen to the tutor, you're not going to get the result, the correct result. Now, of course, they think they follow the Torah. But they follow traditions. What is today, of course, falsely called Judaism is rabbinism. It's rabbinism. It's not Judaism, it's rabbinism. The Judaism of the rabbis is no more the Judaism of Moses than Roman Catholicism or liberal Protestantism or the Christianity of Jesus. It takes the name, different beliefs. Let's continue. So it goes from the patriarchal down to the mosaic. That's his second phase of his apology. He sums it up like this in verse 51. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised, resisting the Holy Spirit, the Ruach Kodesh. You're doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. You did not keep the Torah. Well, Just look at your own history. Look at the Old Testament. <laughs> King Manasseh saw Isaiah in half. They threw Jeremiah in a well and left him for dead. <laughs> so, of course you're going to reject the Messiah. They didn't like hearing this. They did not like hearing this, and it got them outraged. Now, let's be careful. He says, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. God only blames three people for the death of Yeshua. Satan, they were not crucified the Lord of glory. The son of perdition, Judas Iscariot. It would be better for that man to have not been born. It must happen. But woe by him by whom he is betrayed. And Judas is, of course, a type of the Antichrist. And the third is God himself. It was the will of the Lord to slay him. God does not blame either the Jews or the Romans for the death of Jesus. But once you reject him after he has risen, then you become culpable. You become one of his murderers. God is more than willing to absolve Jew and Gentile for the death of his son. 
because it made atonement for us. But if you don't want that atonement, you're blood guilty. I can't handle this. Verse 54, when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and began gnashing their teeth at him. Do you see that term, cut to the quick? It comes from a Greek word, which we translate quickening. Pay attention. An unsaved person is like a corpse. It can't hear you. It can't see you. It can't respond to you. It can't do anything. It's dead. An unsaved person is dead, according to Ephesians. Something happens called an eclinctos, a conviction, in Greek. Nobody comes as the Father draws him. They get quickened. God puts a measure of life, a measure of life, into the corpse so they can hear the voice of Jesus. Unless God quickened them, they couldn't hear it. Nobody comes as the Father draws him. Now he's willing. He's wanting none should perish, but also reach repentance. He's the Savior of all men, especially those who believe in Timothy. He'll quicken anybody. But they must be quickened. Unless an unsaved person is convicted by the Holy Spirit, unless God puts a measure of life into that corpse, because they're spiritually dead, they cannot be born again. They can hear our voice, and we can witness to them, and we need to, but until they hear the voice of Christ, they're not getting saved. The quickening. Now, at the point of quickening, they have a choice. Choose this day whom you will serve. They wouldn't have any choice if they weren't quickened, because they were dead. A God of love does not create people to go to hell and torture them forever. Calvinism is like Islam, inja Allah. It is theologically Islamic. It is not Judeo-Christian. A God of love does not create, inja Allah, it is Allah's perfect will. If they go to hell, it's God's perfect will. It's rubbish. Jesus said hell was a place prepared for Satan and his angels. God doesn't want anybody to go there. Now, once they are quickened, that is, cut to the quick, they began gnashing their teeth. When an unsaved person is quickened, and they come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, they hear the voice and calling of Christ. They just see enough light, and they hear the beckoning of the Lord to the way of salvation. They can either accept or reject. If they accept, they get saved, become new creations. If they reject, they gnash their teeth. They practice gnashing their teeth because they're going to be doing it a long time. Once quickened, you will either repent and believe or gnashing your teeth. In Northern Ireland, he was kind of too political for my personal taste, but there was a preacher called Reverend Ian Paisley, who was also a politician. And I agreed with everything he said about Catholicism, but the way he said it seemed to be against Catholics in the opinion of many people. He really wasn't, but that was the way he was perceived or presented by the media or misrepresented by the media. And he was preaching an evangelistic sermon in Belfast one day, and he said, that will be white bang and gnashing our teeth. And some lady rather sarcastically said, what if you wear dentures? <laughs> and he said, teeth, madam, will be provided. <laughs> True story. True story. Northern Ireland is like the Bible Belt of Great Britain. It's like Alabama and, you know, Tennessee and that here. Well, let's look. 
Stephen, being filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Pay attention. As we looked at yesterday, through the scriptures, we can understand that there is a triunity of the Godhead, and we can understand the interoperation of the three persons based on the teaching of Jesus in John 14 and John 17. You can know there is a trinity, and you can know how it works. But beyond that, our capacity to comprehend it is limited. We will not understand one God in three persons in its totality until we see the Lord. When we check out, or when he comes for us, when he comes, then we'll get it. Right now, we understand it in part. We understand he is triune. We understand how the three persons interoperate, as we looked at yesterday. But we're never going to completely comprehend it until we check out. It's no mystery what happens when you give up the ghost, the great beyond. Thanatology. Death is not a mystery. There are many mysteries in Scripture. Many. Good and bad. It's a mystery of the gospel. Okay. The rapture is called a mystery in Corinthians. Okay. There's the mystery of iniquity concerning the Antichrist. There's many mysteries. But death is not one of them. For the believer, remember, there's no death, only sleep. Do not be grieved for the brethren who are asleep. Talitat the kumi, the little girl's asleep, Lazarus is asleep. Death is for unsaved people. It's no mystery what we're going to see. We're going to see what Stephen did. Thessalonians tells us we're going to see our loved ones who died in Christ. It's not a mystery. We made it a mystery. We mystified it. But it's no mystery. It's not a Sherlock Holmes novel. It tells you straight out. I used to read Sherlock Holmes when I was off the Conan Doyle when I was a little boy. I liked to read Sherlock Holmes books. Well, let's look. I see the heavens opened up, the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And he's, the Holy Spirit's there, the Father's there, Jesus is there. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, you see that. Just like Hebrews, outside the camp. The Yom Kippur scapegoat had to be executed outside the camp. Jesus was crucified outside the walls of Jerusalem. What happens to Jesus happens to Stephen, and it happens to faithful believers. The religious establishment and its apostate state will put us out. In the last days, the Harlot Church will put us out. We take the reproach of the, of the Lord. It's always been like that. Uh, the Vatican, according to Eusebius, the historian, that was not a holy place. They buried the Christians there and they killed them. <laughs> uh, I live in London most of the time in England, and there's a place called Bone Hill Fields. Bone Hill Fields were originally called Bone Hill across from John Wesley's house and chapel. And in there is buried like John Bunyan, the Pilgrim's Progress, and John Wesley's mother, and Isaac Watts, the hymn writer, when I survey the wondrous cross, all these believers. George Fox, the founder of the Quakers, all these preachers and believers are buried in there. And why? Because the Church of England wouldn't let them be buried in consecrated ground, and the Roman Church wouldn't let them be buried in 
National Cemetery. They put them in the Bone Hill Fields. It was like a place of, it was like a, a social stigma to be buried in the Bone Hill Fields. But it's God's holy ground. You can still walk through it and see see the graves of, of John Bunyan. He's, he's buried directly opposite Daniel Defoe, the author of Robinson Crusoe. I don't like to hang out in cemeteries too much, but that one's rather interesting. There's so much Christian history in it. It's incredible. Well, let's look. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, Yeshua, receive my spirit. What did Jesus say on the cross? Father, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. What did Jesus say? Father, forgive them. You see the parallel between Stephen? He was Christ-like. Not only in his experience, but in his character. It should be the goal of every one of us, whether we get knocked off or not. When we check out, we want to be Christ-like. <laughs> I got a long way to go. <laughs> Having said this, he fell asleep. Didn't die. You die, you go to sleep. If you're not saved, you're going to die. Now, by death, I don't mean annihilated. I mean weeping and gnashing of teeth. In Hebrew, olame olamim. In Greek, anyal al engamet. From age to ages, for eternity. You want to spend eternity? Weeping and gnashing your teeth? Or do you want to spend eternity in paradise, in heaven, in the millennial reign of Christ? That's it. That's it. Where do you want to go? Boyle Heights or Disneyland? <laughs> and that's a poor analogy, but it's as close as I can think of in California. <laughs> I went to Boyle Heights once because there's an old Jewish cemetery there where Curly of the Three Stooges is buried. And I went there and I said, Kaddish, the Jewish prayer remembrance of the Three Stooges. <laughs> I actually did that because I'm crazy. I said, he was Jewish. His, his name was Jerome Horowitz. Ch changed to Howard. Falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. To be able to give up the ghost with no resentment or anger towards anyone but Satan. Even love for your persecutors. Because he wasn't going to die. He went to sleep. He went to sleep. Unless the Lord intervenes miraculously, my dear friend and sister who has been the administrator of our ministry in Australia for 20 years, she's going to go to sleep going to go to sleep very soon. Oh, she's not going to die. When somebody gives up the ghost, you can say one of two things. You can say shalom, or you can say shalom lehitraot. Lehitraot is like hasta luego, hasta mañana. Adios, hasta luego, hermano. Hasta luego, hermana. So long till I see you the next time. Okay. Or else it's just so long, very long. 
if my sister and friend Marg gives up the ghost, I will be able to say, Shalom, Rikit Raot. Jesus died her death to give her his life. There's no death. There's only sleep. The grave couldn't control Yeshua, so the grave can't contain us if we're in Yeshua. He died our death to give us his life. He took our sin to give us his righteousness. And Stephen is a classic example. So it is. If anyone here is not truly saved, I don't mean the televangelist con job born again. I mean the real one. If you don't know that Jesus took your sin paid for what you did, as he paid for what we all did. You don't know he rose from the dead to give you eternal life. You have not intended. I was a cocaine addict in New York when I was when I was in college. I was, I was addicted. I was strung out on cocaine. And he saved me. If he can save me, he can save anybody. I was not a nice guy. I'm not a nice guy now, but thank God you didn't know me then. <laughs> You're going to die. You're going to be gnashing your teeth. If you hear what I'm saying now, and you know it's the truth, it's because you're being cut to the quick. You're not hearing the voice of Jacob. You're hearing the voice of Jesus by his spirit. Don't walk out of that door gnashing your teeth. You stay here. You talk to me. You talk to Marco. Talk to us. Don't gnash your teeth. So it was, so it is, the apology and martyrdom of Stephen. God bless.